I see all these people flipping out about these cartoon apes. And I'm like, what? What are these apes? Like, what is going on? One of the best things that NFTs have brought to the table is they have made collecting so accessible to people. All my early collectors are OGs in my mind. But for me, art is like a need. It's not a want. And collecting is just another form of that. I clicked really fast on the people drop. And I actually managed to get it for $1. If I've collected your work, I'm holding it with diamond hands. If you're collecting something, it could become hot in two minutes or 200 years. Welcome to The Collector's Call, where we chat about art with the top collectors and creators in Web3. I'm your host, Scooter, and today my guest is Rhea Myers, an artist, hacker, and writer originally from the UK who is now based in British Columbia, Canada. Her work places technology and culture in mutual interrogation to produce new ways of seeing the world as it unfolds around us. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Rhea. Rhea, welcome to The Collector's Call. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. I thought to to kick things off, a brief bit of background would be in order. Before you were involved in, in making blockchain art, you were already pursuing creative coding with generative art bots, using AI, visualizing data, along with many other pursuits. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a bit about that? Totally. I mean, I I went to art school to do computer art, which in the early 90s was like largely unthinkable. And I, I eventually went to the legendary Centre for Electronic Arts at Middlesex University in North London. And they sort of threw us at Macintosh graphics programming and the survivors put on a show. And sort of after that, I stuck with the, the programming went into industry to support my family. And yeah, by the 2000s, I was writing code uh, in, in Lisp and Python and JavaScript, inspired by Harold Cohen, inspired by other already classic sort of arts, computing and computational aesthetics projects. And I started making social media bots when when that became a thing because they were a nice way of solving the distribution problem for me because I started out making art that was just images or code and, and my ambition was always to just throw it over the wall and let some poor curator work out what to do with it and I feel quite guilty about that now, and I'm very sorry to all the curators who I've done that to over the years. I am much more collaborative about this now. But yeah, social media bots were a way of sort of consensually getting the art out into the world where people are, with us meeting people where they were, which is a very net art strategy and a stark contrast to my early work with postscript viruses, which are very much a sort of permissionless but non-consensual way of intruding into the circulation of, of signs and images. And so I've been interested in artistic freedom, not as a dog whistle for saying horrible things about people, but genuinely the restrictions placed on people by the power of the state since the early 90s when the sample-based music I liked and the appropriation art that I liked started getting harder for people to make due to some copyright law decisions going the, the wrong way for creativity. And so when Creative Commons came up, we're an organisation who do licences to, to to sort of make it so anyone can, can copy and use and remake and base their work on your own came out. I was massively into that. And my code was also a free software license. And I'm a, a GPL maximist, sorry, everyone else. And so you can see how, like, from the start, I was interested in these problems of, of freedom and distribution and ownership and, and I guess, digitality as, as, as problems of realism. You know, as as things that are had to address in order to not simply be extremely late impressionism. And so by the time I discovered the blockchain, and like I first encountered it in 2011, but it took me till 2014 to really get my, my head around it, 
I, I was, you know, I was very, very, very ready to to dive into it, both in terms of being able to read the code and understanding the principle, both that, you know, this should be a free and public space, but also that, you know, you do need some sort of control of your own life and, and, and meaning that it represents. So, yeah, that was less a potted and, and more a large jarred history, but hopefully that sort of explains how I got from trying to imitate HR Giga on a 16-bit home computer to, to writing my own smart contracts. Yes, that's a large gap of time to cover, but I think thematically you continue to explore a lot of those concepts into your, your blockchain art. So thank you for, for traversing that with us. It's amazing hearing you talk about discovering blockchain in 2011 and then reading some of your early formations, which are available on your website today related to this, still feel fresh and, and ahead of their time to some extent. In, in 2014, while well, Ethereum was, was still being developed, you wrote the article, Art World Ethereum, Identity, Ownership and Authenticity. With that article, you identified three cases for which Ethereum could support the creation and storage of digital art, which you termed smart property. Those included storing artwork within the Ethereum data store, storing a reference to the artwork within the smart contract, or creating a contract that is in and of itself artwork. Most are familiar with the first two examples, but the third is more conceptual and less frequently explored within our space. Could you tell us about how you've toyed with this idea in your 2014 work, Is Art, as well as the subsequent editions that you released earlier this year? Yeah, totally. Um, so code art is, is a thing. Like programmers create what's known as programmer art, which is very much sort of folk art made by by clerks, and, and it's wonderful and has its own appeal. And you do get programs which are in some way aesthetic in their reception. Uh, quines are a good example of this. A quine is a program that outputs its own source code. So like it's a self-replicator in some way and you get viruses, obviously, are designed to, to interfere in people's experience. Fork bombs are designed to, to take down Unix systems and hackers love coming up with more and more elegant and minimal fork bombs and then you get code poetry which tends to be more code than poetry or more poetry that, than code but there are some wonderful practitioners of it like Metz Breeze who I think really does sort of get an amazing balance of, of la the power of language and the power of code as a language. So to write a program that in itself is, is art it does have a small but fascinating history in, in the arts computing and generative art and network arts scenes. And unfortunately, I didn't page my knowledge of this in before the call, so I'll have to gesture vaguely in that direction with apologies. But there's the idea in um, dusty old art history of symbolic form, and that just means structuring a, an image or a sculpture, structuring the art so that it means something, so it says something to people who can recover the signs and understand their distribution in space. And code is a distribution of signs in space, and we can use both the code and its output expressively. It's fantastically difficult to do that because you either want to be efficient in producing the output of the program or you want to be efficient in structuring the, the laying out the sort of form of the code itself. And so if you're concentrating on one or, on one or the other, but people are looking at the wrong thing. It's like the early net art shows where people went up to the PCs and typed in Yahoo's address as it was at the time rather than looking at the art. It's like, I know this is interesting, but that's that you're here to look at the art, not play with the computers, even though the computers are new. So yeah, I mean for me, art is a is a generic competence like like management only actually by which i mean you can make art with anything 
Uh, you can make bad art with anything. You can make good art with anything. Art is code and code is art if you choose to make it so. Sorry, sound like Sean Luc Picard. And the challenge to art is always to extend its territory, extend its domain into areas that wish to exclude aesthetic experience and subjectivity, uh, places that want to be pure economic extraction, that want to be pure conceptual security, that want to be property without a remainder that means or does anything else. And so smart contracts, and, and like a th- Bitcoin has smart contracts every Bitcoin transaction is a smart contract written in Bitcoin's little script language, which is lovely. And and one of the reasons I was so ready for Bitcoin is I'm a big fan of the ancient and largely dead graphics programming language that Adobe made called PostScript, which has some curious similarities to Bitcoin's script. But anyway, yeah, I wanted to do the net art thing of getting into a new space of, of capitalist expansion first and, and sort of planting an artistic flag there so that people couldn't say, yep, there's a space of pure shiny commerce, no interruptions or distractions. I, I wanted to structure the code so that art was already there. So is art very quickly was an absolutely minimal artwork. It has one bit of information, which in computer science is a zero or a one, but that is it's more than the number zero or one. It's the assertion that the code itself is an artwork or not. And nominating something as art with the power of an artist is it's it's the fallacy of the division applied to to the art world's ability to decide what is and isn't art. It's very 60s, it's very exhausted, and it's something that people recognise as a useful cliche of art. So by taking the power of the blockchain, end quotes, as a replacement for the power of the artist for securing the identity of art, I felt this was a nice way of sort of directing people's attention to the possibilities here and sort of it's nice to see people still enjoying that i'm very happy with it and must make t-shirts of it and it's the one that has seized people's imagination which is why i made the edition earlier in the year which sort of remaps the other work i did around that time some of it since through that so it's sort of saying okay here, you know here's the aesthetic that you like and you do understand what's going on here here's the other stuff let let's expand this conversation a bit without being mean about it like you know it really is okay let's you know let's make this more more accessible it's fascinating to hear the thought behind this in terms of trying to to dabble in areas that have been cordoned off from art and where capital is maybe to some degree uncertain. You've you certainly played with those ideas of property and representation, and maybe it would make sense to turn to the ego and its owned, which was your your solo exhibition with Gallery Nagel Draxler in 2023. Yeah, the ego and its owned, Nagel Draxler were absolutely brilliant. I've been begging curators to do enormous vinyl cutout lettering versions of tokens equals text since it was first made and they are the ones who finally did it it looks amazing and the ego and its owned is obviously a reference to the internet's favorite almost marxist philosopher uh, and his work the ego and its own like max sterner who we know primarily from a very meme ready sketch of him that i think Engels made and it's not very flattering but and and the point the point of that was about the, the the sort of the ongoing appropriation and enclosure and value extraction of representations of minority experience by by the media and by techno capital like as as someone who finally had worked out they were transgender you have 
a sort of very quick crash course in sort of being spoken for and over and about and most readily exploitable parts of what you do being strip mined for for economic value without any accompanying social value or, or change and so the ego and its own was me acting out a particularly awful version of that where i wasn't sort of selling the depictions of my experience i was selling what from the point of view of techno science is the actual experience itself which is my brain my mind and so this is recording of my brain waves made using a nice open source eeg kevin who's listening hi kevin has a much better eeg than me this is just a consumer one but i sort of my, my wife who used to do brainwave studies and stuff glued sensors onto my head and then handed me a stuffed shark or a can of coke zero or poked me with with a needle or hugged me or whatever and i recorded my brain waves in response to that and so it's like a kind of one up on performance or body art it's like the performance or body art stopped at the, the boundary of the skin this sort of went into the mind and sort of commodified and sold that experience as as we will all do with Neuralink in a few years time and in itself that's not very blockchaining but the anchoring of that identity of that value on the blockchain and then selling it did act out and then depict this commodification and exploitation of of that experience and and it's not just selling the brain waves like i kind of like to do that i always do just want to sell the data or something important which is just auctioned is very much sort of presenting some source code and data with with just enough aesthetics to sort of frame it for the viewer's imagination and so with this again you've, you've mentioned the continuity of concerns in the work and i'm very grateful to mackenzie wark for pointing out in our discussion the other year that i'm obsessed with property which is very very true have been since my degree show ownership and property and circulation and what those all mean and so yeah sort of there's an old it's not jeff coon's quote which is exploit yourself and and another one by my favorite band singer who said i wasn't angry at the record company for exploiting me i was angry at them for stopping exploiting me competent this is the world in which we 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 live and the world in which blockchain is a thing and which it reflects and is both you know a critique and embodiment of so yeah this this was a way for me to make identity art without it being simply commodifying that to either in comprehension or sell out thanks for walking us through that you've you've discussed this series of works as being one that's that's difficult to to pin down and i think that's your intent in in wanting this to be uh, not easy to grasp and certainly not easy to to be commodified it's it's funny because in this space in particular in the nft realm so much of of understanding or it is often conflated with purchasing it or or the prospect of of purchasing and owning it. One of your works that is a very effective exploration of that concept of ownership is Certificate of Inauthenticity, which yes. I think yeah. began with your shareable ready-mades earlier. Yeah. Can you walk us through what was involved in that project? Yeah, totally. So the shareable ready-mades, which were named by charlotte at, at further field were a series of 3d printable models that i commissioned from lovely and capable 3d modeling artists uh, christine lemma weber and basan Kadali, and they were placed under a creative commons license which meant that anyone could you know download them print them out remix them share them do what they like with them as long as they credited the artists who I put on the license as the 3D modelers, 
and sort of added any text to it that it's, it says, which basically mentioned that I've commissioned it. And this is a way of getting my hands dirty with the issues that I had with sort of all the big post-conceptual artists who would use skilled artisans and, and workshop workers and, and artists to make their work and then sort of present it as theirs without even the Kastabi like gesture of, of signing the, the work to sort of emphasize that they were appropriating it. And so this was me both being that person who, who gets other people to make the work to see how that felt and how it worked and me trying to address that by paying the artists who made the work giving them credit and making sure that all of this labor and reputation was available to others and that the, the objects chosen were sort of trademark high modern and postmodern objects so we, we randomly and for no reason chose a urinal and a balloon dog and a pipe, and I think the urinal was printed out at the 100th anniversary of Cabaret Voltaire, so that was quite fun. And for a while, it was very popular with sellers on eBay selling knockoff MakerBot 3D printers because it looks like it should require lots of support to print, but it actually prints uh, without support because of the lovely curves that Chris made. So that was great. And I was very happy with that project. It did what it was meant to do. A couple of years later, Furtherfield, a lovely gallery and artists, cooperative in the UK I work with, wanted to, to sell some at a show. And I, I made them a certificate of inauthenticity by printing out a Sol Lewitt certificate of authenticity and going over it with some white out and a Sharpie to get rid of the, the Lewitt details and insert my own. And so by the time that the blockchain world was having its second major panic about authenticity and you know, how, how do you know that the work that you have bought is actually from the artist and isn't mint fraud or copy fraud or, uh, you know, just just a, a copy rather than the original? And it's very sort of patrilineal fear of, 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 as, the, uh, as, as the rights put it to being cucked. So my, my response to this is, is very much that, yeah, you can't combine a pseudonymous space of identity play like the blockchain with the the very, very, very heavily police space of singular identity that is art history and the art market without friction, without tension. And that's a good and interesting thing unless you're someone who gets bitten by it. So Certificate of Authenticity doesn't attempt the impossibility of saying I absolutely guarantee in a way that you can evaluate on chain forever that this artwork is authentic for whatever you believe authenticity to be it went the other way and just sort of totally lampshaded and parodied it and said okay if you buy this token and follow the instructions on on the image that accompanies it which is this certificate you will print out the certificate on a laser printer and stick it to the wall. You will print out the Creative Commons license it refers to and stick it on the wall. And you will print out the 3D model that it refers to and sort of stick that next to them. And if you do all of that, I absolutely guarantee that I have had nothing whatsoever to do with your production and presentation of the work. So it's kind of a you know reducio ad absurdum. It's sort of goes the other way from from what people want it sort of gives people what they want which is absolute certainty about authenticity and possession but not certainty in, in the direction that they want it's the no not like that that the interview in my book oh that the writing on my website is also available in my book which is great and you should buy it from urbanomic who are lovely but yeah it's that sort of not 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 Sort of, it's not meant to be a dunk on anyone. I'm not trying to be cruel. I, you know, it's a thing of making people laugh at you so that they can learn, the, like the, the trickster 
function in in sociology so yeah it's it's sort of it's the guarantee of absolute certainty of authenticity that people had realized was difficult to get at the time just in the the wrong direction and and like i didn't run it by a lawyer so if anyone is a lawyer in this there yes I'm, i'm sorry this is sort of not a proper legal document but the language did try to take account of like chain forks and chain death and things like that and i was very sort of happy to see that some of the language in the awesome model thou law that primavera de Filippi and others produced a year or two later had surprisingly similar but competent lawyer written language in there to handle similar things and like this this has been the position i've ended up in in the blockchain space is taking what people are worried about and running with it not to sort of take the 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 the, the unearned security of the person whose critique is only ever to say that everyone else is wrong and foolish but the critique of yeah we're we're all doing this i'm doing this what does it you know what does it mean what can we do better so yeah so that was a bit rambling but that's that's about that project and i love it and the only problem with it is that curators email me and say hi how do we present this work and i say hang on you, you haven't read it it like it says you know i'm guaranteeing i've had nothing to do with it and i'm worried it's i'm always worried it's some sort of advanced legal scam so that it can sue me for breach of smart contract for being involved in the work I promised i won't be involved with and if anyone's ever going to do that please don't <laughs> yeah there's a wonderful element of play and certainly not taking this space too seriously you scoff at some of the tenets of faith held by members of the the crypto community which is which is exactly what we need more people to to be doing you mentioned as well exploring some of our our collective concerns and i i want to come to your book but just before that you've had some earlier writings as well one that i really enjoy is bad shiva sci-fi novella from 2017 about a world that appears to operate on dogecoin where information is decontextualized and there are social interactions that have become commodified i i love the language in this work I, since others are unfamiliar with it i should share some the protagonist at one point states there's a noob who's ahead of me in the rankings, a maze. BangZoom78 has come out of nowhere and is tipping like a true Shiba. Very amaze. I feel a twinge of envy before I remember that we are all going to the moon. Could you tell us about that novella and what you set out to explore through yes. it? Yeah, when it was it was written about two years before it was published. I was I just moved to Vancouver in British Columbia and I, I couldn't work because the fiat state was taking its sweet time approving my my immigration status. So I was spending a lot of time walking around rapidly gentrifying Vancouver and going to art and technology events, which is where I got interested in, in crypto, obviously sort of majorly interest in crypto so you, you can see that in the activities of the protagonist who spends an awful lot of time walking around the these now derelict mcmansions and going to the crypto events but it was i think i described it as my exasperated love letter to the crypto scene in, in vancouver because like dogecoin's secret source wasn't its tech like it had a faster block time, which is probably good, but its secret source was its culture, the culture of sort of virtue ethics uh, that the Doge social media community came up with, of, of tipping each other for doing good things, of being inclusive, of sponsoring ridiculous but wonderful things like returning the Jamaican bobsled team to the Olympics, not ridiculous due to the team i hasten to add who are awesome but the fact that like they're making something that had been turned into a film back into reality and that that culture fascinated me because what you need in order to survive is a robust is an anti-fragile culture so bad shibe i say it's shibe the pronunciation changed at least three times whilst it was being written so for people say it's fine 
Bad Shibe is three days in the life of a, a young idiot who wakes up one morning and starts to question their place in their post-fiat cryptopia. And the reason it's written like that is I couldn't be the fourth person to steal the waking up from a coma opening to Day of the Triffids, like that, that's been done to death. But you need a way of your viewpoints protagonist having to learn things without everybody simply saying as you know and ys who is lovely but has anxiety and a bit of face blindness has not ever had to think about how the world works um it's set around 2033 there's a block time in the story which if you take as a sorry block height which if you take as a dogecoin block height will give you the date to an estimated day but yeah it's a world where that forked off from our own around 2019 probably now although when it got to the point where we had a pandemic possible war with china elon musk pumping dogecoin on social media and a popular movement to sort of buy meme stocks and, and re remake the economy i was slightly worried that i'd been too accurate in my my predictions for the future but then things sort of switched back and yeah it's it's a it sort of fits the answer to the question of what would the world be like if the dogecoin bros of the dogecoin community at the end of 2015 start of 2016 won if they won, what would the world look like? And it's a world with no fiat state, but with a working internet and a world in which the sort of be excellent to each other, sort of Bill and Ted style virtue culture of, of Dogecoin had structured all the society. And it's not a world I want to live in, like YS spends all day picking apples in an orchard and then that sort of buys an apple. For lunch when they go to school in the evening and i genuinely don't know what mum one does for work but it's something that's either criminal or, or grinding or, or boring or something and yeah the, the sort of the the, the the threat changed three times whilst i was writing it the the, the one that it stabilized on was a, a malicious fault Basically, there's a bug in the code that people are exploiting. There's an emergency hard fork hotfix being pushed. And if I ever write the sequel, we will find out what the the code that's being pushed actually does. But it's it's like, you know, what YS is meant to be very, very sweet, but very not selfish, but like, you know, privileged, I guess. You know, they've never had to think. Why does tipping look like paying? Why are other currencies a, a taboo? You know how, how how does this work? And it it was it's an exercise like to a degree it's an exercise in in vibe. It's like it has to give people the feeling that they are in this this world emotionally, and the the really uh, like people love different parts of the story. Some people just love. Mum one doing her happy dance, uh, their their happy dance. Others love YS telling everything that it's their new best friend. Other people love that the tipping does look very much like paying, and that's great and it works. And and the the artist who did the lovely illustrations for it, Nina Theodori, I felt quite bad because I I thought it was a, an unillustratable story because the the narrator firstly doesn't really notice what other people look like anyway and secondly has very good operational security so even if they did they wouldn't tell you and no nope, lena read through this and said i don't understand this at all which i felt was a very brave response and then she said but if it was this sort of strange new future then i wouldn't then I, I wouldn't understand this. So she went back to it and her illustrations are wonderful and they're how I see the world now. Like illustrating an unillustratable story is, is just such an achievement. And and the reason it's a story rather than code or an image or anything is you, you need that kind of immersion for it for it to work. It is very much a sort of imaginative affect of, of 
experiencing like a crypto based society that it's trying to get across and that's something that the, the written word the, the written narrative rather is is uniquely good at, at getting across but yes you should you should read it and it's sort of the language i described was as if i know i can't use that quote but yeah it's very much based on doge speak at the time and uh, reddit slang and stuff so it's fun language yeah it's a wonderful work bad shive is certainly well worth reading in it it's it like all good science fiction feels like it becomes more accurate with each passing yeah. year as you mentioned that captures our it, it almost eerily our, our own communication styles and shorthand that yes. uh, i found myself becoming alarmed at, uh, at some of the similar the, phrasings you use the, the, the version in the book it's the original uncut version, uh, which has about 3,000 more words in it, so even less happens. Well, thank you for, for walking us through that. Turning to your your proof-of-work book, Proof-of-Work Blockchain Provocations, I find one of the, the best pieces of this is the, the beginning anecdotes that I believe are, are from tweets that you made between 2011 and 2021. Yeah. And I, I found a few that are, are similar to or reference the contemporary art world, which I think are, are quite interesting. You've said that contemporary art is fractally encrypted capital, a reminder that the real flippening is when the NFT art world takes over from the legacy art world and petrodollar, freeport, contemporary art versus cryptocurrency, blockchain, NFT art. I'm, I'm curious in what ways does blockchain art disrupt the traditional art world and how does it shape our understanding of what art is or, or should be? So it, it's tricky. I play this character online of someone who, yeah, you know, thinks that, that the petrodollar art world or the fiat art world or the legacy art world is is precisely what it claims to be in terms of being this sort of shining ivory tower of of pure price discovery. Or, or the sort of the critiques of it as this fantastically opaque way of the super rich moving money around with no regard to aesthetics. Like it, these are sort of very easy dismissals to to make. These are very easy gestures to make. Like certainly, sort of people pretending that they're doing something they're not is well worth critiquing but the the, the way that the thing that really interested me was how how do i phrase this how, how the most privileged members of that existing art world reacted to the sort of the minor intrusion of of, of crypto into what they saw as their territory and like i i'm a, a very boring euro lefty and i i'm a very boring culture fan but i also don't enjoy larping and sort of the people not all the people but the people who were saying we have a you know we have this idea of a better world and we're making it real through this art project we're doing so from a place of financial and institutional security that was at odds with how they wanted others to, to live in, in what is still capitalist society. And NFT-based art, crypto-based art, using sort of public, using public blockchains made visible the flow of money. And that was an unforgivable sin for people who worked for, with what was the best one in the world, are enormous trust funds with missions created by dead people racists to, to sort of launder their, their their opinion, launder their reputation by patronage of the arts. And so, yeah, sort of being told you're obsessed with money, you're obsessed with crypto, this is all just about the value of the art. And it's like, have you ever been to an auction? If you have, you know, do, do, do you understand where the money that your foundation pays you, you comes from? And like, this isn't a gotcha. We, we all have to eat. There is no ethical production under, under capitalism, blah, blah, blah. But the immune response to daring to suggest 
that people's wages come from somewhere. That is the 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 thing that people from the art world hated on crypto for. It was absolutely fascinating to me. And so the the, the other the other thing was sort of after an artist who I won't name published some very bad math claiming that every NFT you minted destroyed an entire Amazon rainforest. I got a lot of hate from people on social media and I, I analyze this as one does as a defensive measure. And it was literal anthropological scapegoating. It was that there is a tension within a society that cannot be resolved. Therefore, it must be projected onto an acceptable target who can then be driven out of society, sort of take the problem with psychologically. Because these are all people who like worked for Microsoft or Amazon or these other enormous cloud c- computing operations who are sort of at, at sort of the absolute worst thing you could say is that they are simply another blockchain provider, but they they cut because everyone was running nodes on cloud computing at the time, but like they just cannot cope with their role in the destruction and enclosure of the world. So it has to go somewhere. And so it goes into the crypto bros, because no one they know is a crypto bro. So it's it's cost free. But yeah, sorry, that's massively off topic. And with with the art world, which I love, I love art. I I've, I've loved working with with auction houses and with galleries because they have the institutional knowledge and experience to contextualize and support the production of my art in the way that I would like it to be done. Now, that's specific to me, but there's a lot of people I'm sure that's the case for. And so sort of as as much as I'm very, very happy for public blockchains to bring some sunlight into the hidden corners of art world economics, I also think that distributed curation is essentially a category error. You you want that exercise of taste and in in the aesthetic sense, discrimination, not in the social sense at all. And sort of that that's part of calling something art. This isn't to say that I haven't been fantastically excited by the rise of collecting and curating DAOs. Like that's the fulfillment of the, the dream you can see in the notebook pages at the back of the book and lots of the early tweets. But like th- you know, I think things are more complex and the the lesson I learned from my, my free culture slash creative commons activist era was that the existing systems that look very, very complex and crusty and slow and exploitative have evolved like that for a reason and may just do some good for the things that you claim you also wish that you claim that you also wish to, to do good for. So, yeah, publicly, yeah, turn the canals aside, flood the museums, digitize artworks using lasers and then destroy them using the same lasers so we can upload them to the blockchain where they will live forever. Privately, I think these institutions are sort of by definition guardians of particular kinds of value and whatever changes whatever justice we would like to bring to them i am the kind of artist who sort of wanted that environment and kind of evolved to address it even though my my public is very much in in the crypto space i think fascinating thoughts thank you for for sharing those and and going uh, on a little bit of a segue those are, are where the best insights come from I have lots of questions, but we have limited time. I, I'd love to ask, I know you said that back in, in 2014 when, when blockchain art was just an evolving idea, you thought that smart contracts would become the unit of production of art to enable programs that could manage their own exhibition and sales, for example. We haven't seen a strong evolution in that direction. What do you think caused the art world to move in a, in a different way? And do you think smart contracts will return to center stage in the future? 
So there have been some very good examples of smart contracts that are art or that are artists. Unfortunately, I did not page this knowledge back in, so I can't name them. But definitely there is and has always been good work being done with with smart contracts as art. The reason I thought of that in the first place was because the politics I was acting based on was very anti-financialization, very anti-enclosure, very anti-absentee property. To be clear, it's okay, ANCAPs. I don't want to take your toothbrush. I just mean that for someone owning six houses probably isn't an efficient allocation of capital. And so I was very much making sort of deliberately unownable work that was designed to operate in the sort of Ars Electronica style European, you get paid for exhibiting world, which is a, a, a nice place. And I do like getting paid for exhibiting. And so that's, that's why I structured things as contracts. I mean, also as a software developer, as a code artist, the contracts were the programs in that system. So they seem like the, the obvious focus. And like, some of the stuff I did that sort of I almost invented NFTs a couple of times, but but didn't. I've got the the stuff in Art World Ethereum that is meant to represent the transfer of artworks. And I've got the Ethereum art market, which postdates Monograph, but was being written when Monograph was announced, which led to much swearing. But Monograph is great, so it's okay. So like, I, I was working with these ideas, but I hadn't lent into the affordances of the medium for ideological reasons. And so I, I was very surprised by the rise of NFTs, like very pleasantly surprised, but it took me a while to get my head around them. And it, it was by like looking at the punks, looking at, CryptoKitties disclosure. I later worked for Dapper, but my opinions here are my own and I'm biased by that fact. That I sort of realized that, that the key element of blockchain was, was property. It was this securing of, of digital existence to, to a particular owner. And I know that's obvious, but like to sort of come to that realization from a, you know, a, a position which was sort of not inclined to realize that for ideological reasons is quite the pivot. And so, you know, I'd, I'd missed the fact that ownership was the, the key affordance, and I lent into that for a while. I would love to do more smart contract work. I mean, to a degree, the is art editions are me doing that. The, the sort of the token ownership of it is very much just saying sort of people want to own this and I need to make a living as an artist. So, you know, if this is the obvious and easy way of making digital art ownable. And for, for smart contracts coming back, I was very surprised at the composability era and the utility eras of, of NFT discourse didn't give rise to more smart contract art because having code that does interesting things in communication with with other code is absolutely what what smart contracts can do and yet people are just chasing well i mean at the time they were chasing 10k pfp drops now they're chasing meme coins and like i i don't want to be down on those i think the 10ks were absolutely fascinating cultural objects movements moments and that meme coins has something to say about the very basis of re of reality itself within capitalist society but they don't move us forward or, or deepen our representation of the technology and and the sort of game theory and the the sort of background culture of, of all of this so yeah i mean i i do I do think that smart contracts, where the where the, the the smart contract is the singular work, so like a one of one token, I guess, where where the smart contract is is more interesting artistically than the cover image, is is something that is absolutely ripe for for 
rediscovery and, and, and for sort of, you know, saying, okay, this is a possibility that we bypass, let's dig into this now. And, and we know so much more than we did when we started writing this code, like sort of solidity as a usable language now. The, the flow language that I helped in a trivial way with, with development of on, on of like the cadence programming language on, on flow and disclosure, what that, blah, blah, blah. Like it's just so much more expressive than, than, than previous languages. And yet everyone is just copying and pasting token code to, to, to try and make, you know, that, that's the next, the next breakout token so yeah I, th- I think it's tricky that that the sort of there's 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 a literacy that you need to look at code and even if you can read code in one language unless you are sort of old and a programming language nerd like me it can be difficult to read other languages and so like if if the code of the contract is is the point of it that can be difficult but the behavior of smart contracts their ability to embody rules to embody like constitutions in, in the form of DAOs, and and their representation of a singular medium for value behavior rules and 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 ownership is is unparalleled. It's the first time we've had something like this since the 1700s when you would walk into a print seller's shop and buy a print on paper with money on paper and have the ownership of that registered on a paper ledger. It's like, you know, you can can buy a contract or or an NFT on the blockchain with money on the, the blockchain. It will exist on the blockchain and it will behave itself on the blockchain so like this should be an amazing plastic medium for 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 art but both blockchain hatred from from the art world and and public and get rich quick via tokens thinking from sections of of, of the blockchain world really work against that which is sad for everyone involved it's certainly an area that's ripe for rediscovery. You've dabbled more than your fair share with these, and, and I hope others will wade back into the, the area of smart contracts because there, there's lots of, of fruitful opportunity there. Rhea, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a question about your, your latest creation, Portents, which was auctioned with Verse, presented by Grailers Dow just this week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that piece? Totally, yeah. So Verse and Grailers were absolutely amazing to work with. I love that kind of creative partnership and the concepts for the show that Luke presented was just so strong, you know, about time on the blockchain because sort of if you read Satoshi's white paper, Satoshi doesn't say the word blockchain. He says timestamps and like blockchains are about time they are about making time real and concrete and, and and secure and that's what gives us the the ability to make nfts to make these tokens to to make cryptocurrency and it's something that makes itself real over time like in a very real way bitcoin is an object from 100 years from now of 21 million, well, just short of 21 million coins that makes itself real, that makes that future real with each block. With each block, that future becomes more and more and more certain, backed by an appreciable percentage of the Earth's computing power. And that, and that just fascinates me in all sorts of ways. And so seeing a show that was sort of bringing that out and that worked with Ordinals, who, which was a project that I, I loved. I think people misunderstood a comment made once about it, which was meant to be, I haven't looked into this, it looks interesting, and not, I'm not looking into this because I don't like it, like it's the former, not the latter. But yeah, the, the sort of what I've referred to lovingly as the, the, the air of numerological mysticism to Ordinals, is a step up from Satoshi's very, very orderly fulfillment of the cypherpunk project of, of 
stateless peer-to-peer money. It sort of bootstraps meaning on, on, on top of that by structuring its argument in a very suggestive way using different representations of information in different schemes in terms of naming and sort of bootstrapping of of i guess salience or or or, or you know, just meaning from the existing but unused properties of the bitcoin blockchain and like i i just love that so portents is very much a love letter to that and it takes the idea that culture is a secret source and that you know you can look at existing data at existing code and find and extract and exploit surplus value in that and it turns out to 11 and so the result is a conspiracy theory or cult doctrine that holds that someone from the future or possibly the CIA having broken encryption and a whistleblower trying to tell us this, placed the names of ordinals, which didn't exist at the time, into past block hashes of the Bitcoin blockchain. And there is proof of this. If you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, you will find that the least significant bits of several blocks back in the day contain ordinal identities, ordinal numbers. And so we have this proof that, you know, this time travel, that this prophecy has has come to happen. And if it is possible, this must be a world of plenty that it's coming back from. This must be sort of fairly incredible to have like mastered time travel. So this is probably a future that you want if you're a Bitcoiner. And so you know, let's pursue this and make this future come to be. And, and you'll notice how that resembles like Bitcoin's making itself real and ordinals symbolic surplus value. And it's it's you know, it's a wonderful story. The code is is real, the numbers are real. The only problem is that ordinals are small integers. And if you look at the last few bits of any number, they're a small integer. And so this is sort of the reason I say conspiracy theory as well as cult is is sort of this is a a, a meaningless pattern. It's a pattern that you would expect to be there based on chance. But the human brain works on this kind of suggestibility and this kind of discovery of, you know, shapes in the cloud, paradoxia in, in nature and the built environment. And from that, we, we build our meanings and build our futures. And so, yeah, Port Portance was sort of an, an explicitly irrational model of what it is like to build a future based on more than sort of just a rational argument because rational arguments don't really win debates with apologies to all of my philosopher friends you know the memes will win Uh, memeing things into existence is definitely a thing and ordinals has, has been very successful at doing that and, and none of this is to dismiss the, the robustness of, of the standard or the good work that went into it. But what interests me isn't like this successful take on the old coloured coins standard. It's what it took to make it successful in terms of presenting the argument to to human beings. And yeah, Port Portance is like a, a depiction or a model of that which... But the argument I made to, to to Luke and people wasn't this is real. It's we have to believe that someone could think this is real, and and that's what it's presenting. That sort of experience of like not believing something but seeing how someone else could believe it, and the way that that sort of built, has built so much of crypto. And that is still what it looks to to no coiners, to people on the outside. But it's it's tricky to to capture, you know, that that affect, that subjectivity, and and present it as as a logical argument in itself. And so the way to to sneak up on that was to to produce 
a white paper in the format that white papers are produced, a project logo, because everything needs a project logo, and a nice convincing spreadsheet, which goes for proof by overwhelming presentation of numbers, like proof through overwhelming notation. And and it's it's very sort of, to, you know, it's, it's a new work, but I'm very happy with it. To my mind, it succeeds what it does. I'm very happy with the reception it got, with how pleased the buyer is. And my, my only concern is that, like the are we there yet system from, from Bad Shive, someone will come up to me in a hacker space and say, hey, you figured out how to make this real because uh, we should not make the torment nexus. It, it's not a good idea. It's like all of your work, a very well thought out creation. I really liked Grey-Louis Dow's description of this as conspiracy theory as performance art. And yeah, perhaps yeah. your worry is that the performance is, <laughs> is too believable. Yeah, it's it's tricky sort of given who I am and, and that I'm an artist and stuff like having people think that I have delusional beliefs is not a good position to be in so i couldn't lean into hey guys this is real as much as i wanted to but yeah sort of great grailers sort of took that in the, in their step and yeah the, the sort of description is great and and this is sort of what i mean about institutions like a dao is a blockchain thing but it's still a centralization of decision making and, and capital and so on and if we take a naive view that centralization bad, then that sounds like a bad thing. But in terms of pooling talents and capabilities to have access to that kind of support, as, as an artist, is absolutely wonderful and helps make much better art for whatever one's value of good art is. Sorry, Peripholites. <laughs> <laughs> We usually wind down with a question related to collecting. I've heard you reference Vitaly Komar and Alexander Melamed as two of your favorite fiat artists. Can you tell us a bit about the, the kind of work they created? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, Komar and Melamed were a couple of expat Soviet artists, given the era, who went to the United States in the 80s and sort of did the sort of malicious compliance slash disobedience through obedience kind of work that I love, uh, which is a strategy where someone says, the world is like this, and you paint their description and show it to them, and they say, no, that's terrible, that's not what I meant at all. No, but that's what you said. And so they would do things like hire public opinion companies who at the time would have to phone people up and say hi we're a public opinion company what do you think of the next president or whatever and then get them to ask people what they most liked in a painting and what they least liked in the painting and they would then paint it and so you would sort of get a picture of abraham lincoln by a lake with some mountains and it looks terrible and it's not not because they didn't paint it well they painted it very well but it was sort of this this not quite right image and they would paint like a little garishly colored composition of triangles which was what people didn't want and that kind of dealing with the gaps in people's understanding was just so good they, they also opened a company that bought artists souls and was going to sort of you know show a return on them they bought Andy Warhol's soul and that's where I stole the idea for my soul the, the early token work from because like there's you know there's this there's a very materialist imminence to, to crypto which was a very materialist imminent type of person I love but in in the public imagination it's very obviously opposed to any kind of spirituality or ineffability and sort of the idea of a soul was was very very useful to to oppose to that so yeah i i love their their sort of usage of of public opinion and understanding and values as as the materials of of their work it's yeah that they're really good and Kevin, who I think is on the call, taunted me by saying he has a work of theirs, and, and I don't. So the, 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 art, the artwork I'm sat in front of here is a Harold Cohen Aeron drawing from, I think it's the Tate era in, in London, and that sort of just watches me as I do my work each day and, and says that I should get back to my plot as soon. 
a, a lovely work of computer art to to have near you. And I'm happy to hear about some of the influence and inspiration you've drawn from from earlier artists for some of yeah. your endeavors yeah. within the blockchain art space. Oh yes, yeah. that my, my art is always fantastically referential. So it's always someone else's ideas. I'm sort of very much from the appropriation slash remix era of of culture and I'm not gonna leave that anytime soon. Well it's wonderful to hear and and to hear you acknowledge that as well. Rhea, you've been very generous with your time today. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? So yeah, buy, buy my book, kids. It's great. I've got a project called 10K Drop coming up, which gives you the opportunity to own an entire 10K Drop. You don't even have to sweep the floor. That's coming out shortly with your George Banks behind that, who's the curator who um, first exhibited my my work with um, Kate Vass Gallery all the way back in, I want to say, 2015. So that, that's fun. And beyond that, yeah, I mean, sort of, you know, enjoy believing things, but sort of never swallow anything whole, I guess. Great advice to wind down on. Ria, I'll just close by saying that your sustained exploration of blockchain art, as well as theory and writing, really helps us to to understand this technology and its relationship with art as well as our own lives. Thank you so much for joining us today to share your story. Thank you. This has been brilliant. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. And don't forget to join us at our next collector's call.